Okay, good. So um, now I will talk a little bit about uh, one of the topics of research that we're doing most, which is multiple object tracking. And so I want to um, reintroduce a bit the slides that I presented on the first day. So for full um, dynamics in understanding, we need to analyze every pixel of a video. And this means um, not only semantic segmentation, uh, which happens at uh, the image level, uh, but also identifying each of the semantic classes into, for example, different instances, different persons, which is uh, instance-based semantic segmentation. And finally, um, dealing with videos. So dealing with um, different frames that have exactly the same semantic classes that are moving along and therefore uh, match the semantic classes, the instances from one frame to the other. And this last part is what I'm going to talk about right now. So how to perform this matching from one frame to the other. And so um, multiple object tracking can be uh, very simple or can be rather complicated, as you see, for example, in this scene. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to focus mostly on people tracking. Um, it's quite interesting because um, crowded scenes uh, have a lot of occlusions. Detections is already uh, quite a hard task uh, in there. And so um, tracking all the objects in such scenes is actually quite challenging. And um, I'm also not going to talk about segmentation. So um, for this particular talk, the goal is to actually detect in the sense of obtaining a bounding box um, each of the pedestrians in this scene and then track them over time. So throughout the video and through occlusions and reappearances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so usually the, the most used paradigm um, for, uh, for tracking is actually the one of tracking by detection. So in there, uh, we actually have a video. Let's say we have these three frames. Uh, we separate the task of tracking first into detection. So we do want to have a bounding box around every person in a scene. And um, this is already quite a hard task as you have seen. So there's um, occlusion problems, as we see in the first case here. Um, there's problems which happen right now less with deep learning, but with previous methods, there was this famous tripod that was always detected as a person because it has this kind of tree shape, I guess. Um, then there's the problem of having crowded scenes in which you have uh, one person that is crossing another person. There's suddenly also um, a baby here. So um, it's also unclear how many detections we should have here. And so usually um, detections are not perfect. Uh, so we're going to start with an imperfect set of detections. And on top of this, we have to perform tracking. And tracking is defined as finding um, corresponding uh, bounding boxes. So we start, for example, uh, from this frame where we have the blue detection. And now we want to find exactly the same person in the next frame. So this is quite easy in this case, where we see that the person is actually quite isolated and we have both detections in both frames, so we can make an easy match. Uh, but we can start to see that um, there's going to be problems in the frames where this person actually crosses the occlusion and maybe we're missing the detection there. Um, but let's say the blue trajectory is an easy one. Um, and what we can do is we can actually express um, the problem of tracking uh, with a network flow, with a graphical model. So what we do is we place each of the detections as a node in a graph. So in this case, we will have for the first frame three nodes which represent these three detections. It doesn't mean that all three detections actually belong to a person. So you can see here that, for example, there is this tripod detected, but still we need to include it as a node in our graph. And we will do the same for all the frames in our video. So we will create this um, sort of temporal graph where each node represents a detection. And actually now um, what we want to do is we want to solve this graph. So we want to find the detections in this graph, um, sorry, the trajectories in this graph. And for this, what we want to do is we want to match these detections from frame to frame. So in this case, if we solve uh, the minimum cost flow problem, we actually obtain this set of detections, um, of trajectories, sorry, that are matching the detections, which means that um, according to the algorithm, this node here and this node here belong to the same trajectory, so belong to the same person. And um, the idea now is that 
um, if each node represents uh, a detection, what is important to match these detections are actually how we define the edges. So how we define the connections between detections at frame t, t plus 1, t plus 2, etc., etc. So you can see before that we had um, certain connections. You can have a densely connected graph. You can prune some of the edges. Uh, but in general, what we have here is that, for example, this detection can be matched to this one or to this one. And by actually computing this, um, by solving this minimum cost flow problem, we're actually choosing which detection, um, which two detections belong together. Now, the nice thing about this is that uh, we can do this globally. So if we actually do choose that this detection and this detection belong together, now all the other detections in the first frame cannot be matched to this one. So naturally, this expresses a nice property of tracking, which is that one detection cannot belong to multiple persons. So um, once we, um, we, have this, uh, we have the nodes defined, which are naturally the detections, the most important thing is how do we actually define these edges. And so um, first, I want to show you a little bit how this um, minimum cost flow problem is defined. So it's actually a minimization problem. And um, the costs are going to be associated with each of the edges. And so uh, let me just break it down for you a little bit. So each edge is defined as a pair ij. So this connects the node i with the node j. And each node is going to have uh, each edge sorry, is going to have associated a cost and an indicator function. Now, um, this indicator function can take the value either 0 or 1. 0 means that it, this edge is not active, and therefore detections i and j do not belong together. And when the indicator is 1, it means that these two nodes actually belong to the same trajectory. So this is actually um, what is indicating uh, which nodes belong together. So it's forming our trajectories. And now the most important thing is how do we actually define the costs? Um, so the cost is um, what will actually drive our tracking. And we have to think that this is actually a minimization problem. So the lower the cost for ij is, the more likely it is that these two nodes are matched together. So um, if we have two persons with, uh, which are actually representing the same person in different frames, so we have these two detections, we want to assign a really low cost to these two detections. If they belong to different persons, ideally, we want to assign a high cost. And you can see, for example, in this case, that if we're focusing, for example, only on appearance, these two persons are dressed very similarly. So most likely, the, these two pairs of boxes and these two pairs of boxes are going to have the same type of cost. Because you're just seeing, well, this is a, a man dressed in black. The other is also a man dressed in black, so more or less, they could be the same person. Illumination could have changed slightly. Um, so this is actually a very sensitive task to assign this cost to each pair of bounding boxes. Um, so one can do different things to measure bounding box similarity. Uh, one can use simply the distance, so you know that a person is not jumping around in the video, so you assume that person is moving just very little for, from frame to frame. So you just use distance and say, well, I want to minimize um, the cost multiplied by this indicator function. So uh, the closer the objects are, the better. So direct pixel distance is one measure you can use. Or you can use some sort of appearance similarity. And this is where actually deep learning uh, will be useful right now. Uh, but what we actually proposed um, some in some works, um, starting actually from my PhD thesis, was to model uh, pedestrian motion and interactions. So not only appearance, but also the type of motion. Um, now, there were um, several proposed works ranging from um, absolutely no learning to a bit uh, of learning towards finally um, full learning pipeline with deep learning. And uh, I'm going to comment more these last works and finally a possible full deep learning pipeline for the whole tracking problem. Right now, this is only about modeling bounding box similarity. Um, so the first one is um, actually using a physics-based uh, model of crowd motion. 
And this means that we have a series of forces defined by physicists that tell us how people move around each other. So basically how people avoid each other, how people avoid obstacles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so what we can do is we can build this into our tracker to improve tracking. Um, I'm not going to comment on this work because there's absolutely no learning there, so it's not so interesting for this particular summer school. Um, but in the next work, um, it's kind of based on uh, the weaknesses of the previous work. So here we say, well, um, we don't want to actually handpick and define each of the forces that drive a crowd motion, but we actually want to learn them from the images. So um, in the previous work, there were just three terms for, for crowd motion. And now here, what we want to do is we want to expand these three terms and we want to say, well, we don't define any of these terms. Um, we don't fix them, but we actually learn them from images. And how we did this was actually, um, we took um, an image patch, which was centered around the pedestrian that we wanted to analyze. And then uh, we used the available detections that we had. But of course, we see here already the first problem that uh, we don't have this person detected because it's just too occluded, so any detector uh, doesn't capture this one. Um, but still, we want to compute um, some sort of forces with respect to this person. Now, even if this person is not seen, um, we know that these pedestrians are going to move a bit to the right in order to avoid this person, so we want to capture this from the image. But we cannot use RGB because it doesn't give us enough information to detect this person, so we can use, for example, optical flow. So optical flow, um, for those of you who don't know, measures the motion for each pixel from the previous frame to the current frame of the video. And so you can see, for example, that these two persons are slightly moving to the right. So this is actually the color coding um, for, this, uh, for this optical flow representation. And you see that the reddish color means moving to the right of the image. So these persons are already um, trying to avoid this person that is coming um, from the left. And at the same time, we can see that there's already some sort of features um, that indicate that there might be a moving um, person or a, a moving object on the left side of these two pedestrians. So for example, we can already see in the optical flow channel that there's a chance to actually perform um, not detection, but actually um, to predict the, the motion of these two pedestrians with respect to these features and that it will tell you that these two are moving a bit to the right because they are trying to avoid something that is coming from the left. So this is exactly uh, what we did in, in this work of um, learning an image-based motion context. So we took our image, uh, we extracted a bunch of handcrafted features, so this was um, a bit uh, pre, at least my deep learning um, period. So features were still handcrafted, uh, but we did use um, half forests, which are a variation of random forests, to actually directly estimate from these features the velocity uh, of the pedestrian in image pixels. So in this case, um, in red are the votes for these half forests for possible velocities for this pedestrian, and the green arrow is the final estimation, which is basically the average uh, among all these predictions. So, of course, you can already see that this is uh, kind of a pre-deep learning phase, but it's um, quickly approaching what deep learning methods are, are doing right now, which is some sort of uh, feature extraction, and then um, the final prediction into uh, whatever you want to estimate. Um, so this gave actually um, quite good results. So if we look now at um, errors of uh, pedestrian velocity estimation, we see, for example, uh, ground truth vector in red and the predicted vector in green. And what we want to plot now is the histogram of the angular errors. So we want to know how much um, are we, uh, how precise are we in terms of angular errors. So here we don't plot uh, the magnitude at all. And we see that, for example, if we use um, the optical flow, which in principle is um, the right way to do estimation from one frame to the other, so the right way to estimate motion. Uh, we see that the histogram of the errors is quite spread. So there are errors up to 180 degrees. So of course, the more to the left uh, you are, the better. It means your errors are smaller. 
if you actually use the social force model, which is this uh, physics-based uh, motion model where you actually um, design every uh, bit of force that happens between pedestrians, between pedestrians and objects, uh, we see that prediction is a bit better. And if we use um, this method, actually prediction is quite good with most errors being between 0 and 20 degrees. Which means that now with this method, we actually have quite a good prediction um, of where the pedestrian will go in the next frame. Um, now, as I said, this was um, pre-deep learning. So, of course, then we moved along to not only um, predicting uh, or learning appear uh, motion models, but also um, learning the appearance together. And so uh, what we proposed is, um, since we're actually comparing two bounding boxes, so we want to know um, how much do uh, the bounding boxes of frame T match to the bounding boxes of frame T plus 1. Again, a natural decision is to use a Siamese neural network. So we already explained a little bit how it worked in the first, uh, on the first day. So essentially what this does is it compares these bounding boxes from frame T and frame T plus 1, and then gives you directly a score. So it gives you directly uh, whether two bounding boxes belong to the same person or whether the bounding boxes don't belong to the same person. And the nice thing about this is that it also filters out bad detections. So for example, you can see here in this detection that there's actually no person inside. I don't know why it was fired as a, as a person detector there, but it sometimes happens given the, the, how the features are distributed, how the image, um, the RGB channels are distributed. And uh, what will happen basically with this detection is that it will never be matched to any of the other detections at frame T plus 1. So it will, it will be naturally filtered. And so um, now we can feed this into the network flow, or um, I also call it linear programming um, tracker. And so with this set of um, good affinities between bounding boxes, you can solve your graphical model. Now, uh, I just want to comment a little bit more um, the design or the architecture that we used here, just because there's, uh, there's a couple of interesting features. Um, so first of all, we use both um, an image uh, channel and an optical flow channel because, uh, again, we want to encode not only the appearance of the person, but how the person is moving. Um, then we stack all of these together and we feed it into a series of um, convolutions, uh, fully connected layers, et cetera, et cetera. This is not the interesting part. But um, we saw that after doing this, the prediction was actually not so good. And this is because we were missing a series of um, really simple, but at the same time, really powerful features. And these were actually um, what we call at the time the contextual features. So for example, the height of the bounding box, the width of the bounding box. Um, the idea is that you, if you are a person, you're walking through a scene, you cannot suddenly be detected as a huge bounding box, which means that you are really, really close to the camera. And in the next frame, be detected as a really small time, uh, bounding box, because this would mean that you would be really far away from the camera. So you would have moved a lot. So uh, in some sense, the width and height have to remain somehow um, constant or uh, decrease or increase in a smooth way. But there can be no sudden changes. And at the same time, as I said before, the distance also needs to change um, just little by little. So all this information, uh, what we can do is we can uh, merge it together with the features obtained uh, from the last fully connected layer and now use uh, whatever classifier you fancy, um, SVM, in this case we use boosting, to make your final prediction whether um, these two bounding boxes belong to the same uh, detection, uh, to the same trajectory or to a different trajectory. So whether they are representing the same person or not. And in this case, just using these features and concatenating them in this way gave us a huge boost in performance. Um, so sometimes here uh, with the take home message is that if you have some um, features that represent only something like three, four numbers, you still want to include them uh, in your prediction, um, it's quite useful to um, concatenate them with your 
last or uh, one to last fully connected layer and then put them together into a classifier. Okay, so now all of this uh, was actually um, just trying to predict uh, bounding box similarity. So not using any, um, any other type of, of long, let's say, temporal information, long-term dependencies. And we still relied on a matching method on uh, network flows um, to actually make the, to actually find the trajectories. So um, there are still a couple of, of uh, interesting improvement directions that were presented, for example, at this last CVPR. So I just dropped here the references in case you're interested. Um, so the first one uh, is actually about learning better uh, appearance models. So what you want here is you want to find even better features um, for, um, to detect this um, or to give, let's say, a score to this bounding box similarity. And for this, you use um, some uh, of the re-identification methods. So in re-identification, it's, it's, it's a similar task to tracking. So you want to identify um, the same person twice, but for example, from different camera views or um, after a super long occlusion, so you cannot rely on motion models anymore. Um, so I would say this is actually a really interesting paper to read if you want to know how to perform patch similarity, even not for tracking, but for any task. Uh, and finally, this is more uh, of, a, of an optimization work that we did um, for multi-detector fusion. So when you not only want to use um, body detections, but also head detections, for example, how can you change your optimization algorithm to perform tracking? So this is more from an optimization side, if you're interested. Um, but we're in a deep learning summer school, right? So uh, we want to learn everything. We don't want this network flow, this graphical model, um, driving our actual tracking. So the question is, can we actually learn the whole tracking task with neural networks? Well, um, there's, a, there's a set of problems, but I would say the most important one is uh, the problem of the dimensionality of the output. So if you think uh, how neural networks actually process image and what is the input, what is the output, is actually, um, it's always a fixed sized output. So there's always um, some sort of tensor um, as input and some tensor as output. And in tracking, we do not really have this. So we don't know the number of detections per frame. And this is why um, object detection is performed using proposals, for example. And we also don't know um, the length of each trajectory. So we don't know for how many frames um, should we actually predict this trajectory. Because at some point, this person disappears from the scene, but we don't know at which point. This means that we cannot use classic neural networks in the sense of having a fixed input, fixed output, because we don't know the size of the output. So one first solution that we can use is uh, what I'm going to present actually in the last lecture today, which is going to be um, the set learning lecture. Um, so in set learning, uh, we don't want to predict tensors as output, but we want to predict sets. As, as, you, as you will see, sets have um, unknown size and also have, um, um, well, there's a question with permutation. So the order um, of the elements within the set is important. Um, but I'm going to present this um, later, later today. And um, right now I want to present um, the recursive solution. So um, one recursive solution that was already uh, proposed in 2017 was actually, of course, to use a recurrent neural network. So any time that someone thinks about recursive, um, RNNs pop up. So um, there's a certain set of trajectory properties, um, such as, for example, when does the trajectory start? So the birth of the trajectory, the death of the trajectory, the transitions, which can be somehow associated with the motion model. And what you can do is take a huge RNN and start predicting all of these properties uh, with this RNN and just train the network to predict when to start a trajectory, when to finish it, and where to go in the next frame. Um, now, this is an interesting idea. The problem is that it does not work well. And when I mean it does not work well, it means that it doesn't work at all. So it's really, really bad at making the predictions of transitions. And it also tends to um, create and kill a lot of trajectories. So it kind of overshoots everything. 
And um, the question that, that the authors make in the, uh, in the paper and also offline is that, uh, well, maybe we don't have enough data to train such models. So as was said before, um, image, an image task is actually much simpler because you have one image, you process it, you have one output. Uh, but now the question is here, we want to capture a bunch of things with a single network. We want to capture the motion, we want to capture the appearance, so maybe we just need really a lot of data to train such an RNN. Um, so what we actually propose um, now is, um, okay, let's just break down the problem. Let's not um, target it all at the same time. So let's just take one trajectory at a time and one frame at a time. So um, for this, we, we actually use a part of um, FASTRCNN um, that has already been trained. So we, as I said before, we might not have enough training data, so we want to reuse as much of the uh, trained CNNs and, and RNNs that we can find in the literature. <coughs> and one interesting thing about uh, FASTR CNN um, is that uh, is the bounding box regressor. So um, you have already seen this architecture, so you're familiar with um, the feature extracting part, and then um, all this process down here, which happens for each region of interest, basically for each detection. So for each detection, you're going to have um, your classification score and your bounding box regression. And the idea is that the, this bounding box regression takes your proposal and kind of refines it to fit exactly to your person or to your cat, dog, um, car, etc. And in the case of tracking, we're actually interested in this regression part. So this has been trained in a crazy way. It's really, really accurate, and it really snaps your bounding box to um, the actual pedestrian or uh, object that you're, trying to, um, that you're trying to detect. So the question is, can we actually reuse this regression so that we don't need to retrain a motion model? Um, so what we do is um, we take the detections from our frame, uh, from our frame at t minus 1. So this, um, we process the first frame, we say, Okay, here are three detections. And now we go to frame number two. And instead of recomputing the set of uh, bounding box proposals and saying possibly there are three persons again at frame number two, we have already done this for frame number one. So why not reuse the detections of frame number one as proposals for frame number two? So now essentially what's going to happen is that um, these three detections are going to be evaluated in a similar fashion as any proposal would. And so the bounding box regression is going to take this box, which is positioned not so good, because of course the person has moved a little bit, and it's going to snap it to the current position of the person. Now with this, uh, we have accomplished a couple of things. Um, so first, um, sorry, this was what uh, was I said before. But we have accomplished a couple of things. Um, so we have. Um, first of all, made a match between um, the detection of the previous frame and the detection of the current frame. Because essentially we have, we say, this is person number one. Now we plug this into the regressor, and the regressor says, this box, so person number one, has moved to this position. So now essentially we have matched the, the detection at frame one with the detection at frame two, without even training anything. This is just taking um, the, the detections from the last frame as proposals for the future frame. And so if we have actually solved the question of where did detection one go in the next frame, we have essentially tracked this person. So we can now do this recursively. We can go for uh, detection number two, detection number three, frame by frame, and we just um, keep regressing the position of these persons to the next frame and so we're basically tracking the persons from one frame to the other. Of course, we, on the background, uh, run still um, a new detector, so a new set of proposals for each frame, just in case a new person appears on the scene, so we can start tracking it. Um, now, of course, like the, this is, um, I mean, this is a rather surprising approach because we have 
essentially done nothing. We haven't trained any network. We have just reused uh, the regressor in a different way. And so there are, um, th there's a clear, a clear advantage to this, um, to this approach, and that is that this regressor is extremely well trained. And so it will give us really good um, position, really well positioned bounding boxes. So the bounding boxes are going to really fit on top of the person. But there are still um, several um, cons for this method. And that is the first one, that the regressor only shifts this box by a small quantity. So if our person has moved a lot, or if we have large camera motion, then we need to compensate for this. Luckily, we can still compute optical flow and compensate for large camera motions. So this was not, uh, was not a problem for the sequences that we tried. And um, the other big problem is that um, we are not really identifying the actual person as the same person in the next frame. So we're just saying, well, we have a bounding box that is around here. We make the assumption that this person has not moved much. And so if there's another person crossing in the back, I'm, you know, the regressor might as well snap to the other person and start following the other person. So there is no notion of um, the appearance of the person or the motion of the person. So you might say, this is going to work really badly. Um, surprisingly, it's um, the top tracker in, in the Mod Challenge benchmark, which is um, happily, because it's, it's my benchmark, so I'm happy to say that it's now the most used benchmark for tracking. And the last published method has uh, an MOTA, which is the, the tracking accuracy measure that is used for, uh, for this particular task. So the MOTA of the last published method was 48.8. And you can imagine that it's really hard to get better and better MOTA from one year to the other. And by doing essentially nothing, we have actually improved the MOTA by five percentage points. So this actually, um, it's surprising, it's, it's good. It's bad because it's hard to publish this work because uh, one cannot say, well, I did nothing, but I'm first on the tracking benchmark, right? I mean, one needs to be a really good writer to write this paper. Um, but the, uh, the interesting thing is that um, essentially what we show here is that all of the previous works were focusing on the wrong problem. So I've also told you that um, what we're actually doing is not analyzing whether the identity of the person has been um, kept the same in the next frame. So let's look at, the, at IDF1, which is the main identity uh, preserving measure. So essentially what it measures is um, somehow a ratio between the identity switches, which is this column here. So you see that we do have um, a fairly large number of identity switches, 900. But compared to the others, it's uh, more or less similar, except this work. Uh, but we still obtain a really large IDF1. So this measure, the higher the better. And we still first among uh, the top methods. And um, how this can be explained is actually that we're detecting so many more uh, pedestrians that having a few more ID switches is actually tolerated. So we're still doing pretty, pretty good. So this means that even though we haven't encoded any specific identity measure, um, appearance, motion, anything, we're still also at the top for keeping um, identities of pedestrians. So this um, brings to um, some interesting conclusions. The first one is that um, the first assumption that was used for tracking, the really old assumption, that objects um, are just moving very little from frame to frame. And so you can use, for example, the distance in the network flow uh, in the graphical model as measurement uh, because it's a minimization problem. Um, this still actually holds, and you can use it in a really simple way to obtain state-of-the-art results. And so the question is now, well, the, the community has been focusing on the wrong problem because this can already be solved by essentially taking the regressor from faster or faster RCNN. And the really hard tasks for tracking are the long occlusions. So when the person really goes behind uh, a building or behind a crowd of people and cannot be detected for a long time. So in this case, your regressor is not going to work. Or for crowded scenes, 
in which um, there's so many people that the regressor is just going to snap at any person without caring whether this is the person that you have been following or not. So these are actually um, the hard cases and the cases that should be targeted with, uh, for example, more, uh, more deep learning. OK, so this is um, actually the end of my talk. Um, do you have any questions?